Hey everybody, welcome to Dom's Den. Today's guest has spent over 30 years in show business as a writer, producer, and showrunner. He's been involved in a long list of successful shows such as 24, Hawaii Five-0, MacGyver, and Magnum P.I. He also wrote a screenplay for an ironically accurate movie that look forward to discussing later, Demolition Man. We'll get yeah. into that. Mm-hmm. Outstanding. Uh, everybody, it's my pleasure to welcome into the den, Peter Linkoff. Yeah, welcome, 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 buddy. Peter. Yeah, buddy. Peter, thank you. Great to be here, guys. I've been I've been loving the podcast, so thank you. Thank you. Yeah. So, and by the way, you said thirty years. That uh, that's actually very kind because I think you shaved a couple off. So thank you for that. Make me feel want, younger than I. We didn't want to age you too much in the opening. <laughs> Hey man, I'm up there too, man. I, 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 I looked at Bron- what Bronx that was like. What? 92. You're a kid, dog. You're compared to you, you're a kid, man. Yeah, but look at you. You got the hair. He always looks good. Always oh, has the hair. It's quickly going. Trust me. It looks full. It looks good. So, it, it looked good a year ago, two years ago. So we want to know the journey from Canada to Hollywood. How did that come about? Uh, well, I grew up, um, so I grew up in, in Chamonix Laval, which is a suburb of Montreal. So, uh, and, uh, a very small community. If you ever watch any of my shows, I always had this little animation at the end of it with a house with a snowplow going by. And, and that was my house. That was actually an animation of my house. And, uh, it always reminded me that uh, my dad would wake me up really early in the morning to shovel the snow and I'd go out, I'd shovel it. And then. 10 minutes later, a snowplow would go by and fill that, uh, fill what I did back, back up. So it sort of like reminded me of the, the TV business. As soon as you're done with one script, there's another one, you know, that you have to, you have to write. So, um, but I grew up in this, uh, I grew up in a, in this, uh, in this neighborhood Laval. Um, uh, we were six, you know, six people in a house, uh, um, uh, and, the closest thing to the entertainment business was the National Enquirer, which my mom would read regularly. And that was like <laughs> our connection to Hollywood. And, um, but I, as a kid and, you know, my mom, I think she, you know, she had always wanted to be a writer. And my uncle was, um, you know, fancied himself a comedian. And, you know, uh, uh, I think there was a lot of arts uh, in our family that was unfulfilled. And um, and I always I always wanted to be a, a, a writer. I, I mean, I, I think I wanted to be an artist or a writer, and I definitely didn't think I was a good enough artist, but I I would, you know, draw cartoons for the school newspaper. I would, you know, write comedy for the for my animation uh, 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 sketches. I wrote a a play when I was a kid called Bar Mitzvah Man and Reuben, the Kosher Crusaders. Um, <laughs> so I, 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 I wanted the to early write. Writings. Uh, what's that? The early writing. <laughs> yes, that was the first. that's great. But I always wrote, and whether it was like plays or short stories or or um, even you know poetry, I always wrote. Uh, it just seemed very odd to my friends because. You know, we'd go skating in the afternoon and then I'd go home and, you know, they'd be, uh, you know, listening to records and I'd be writing poetry. And uh, it was, uh, you know, it was it was um, it was it was something I was very passionate about and and, uh, always had dreamt that if I could make a living doing that, uh, it would be the most amazing job in the world. But, you know, I grew up in a family that, uh, you know, we had one shower. So uh, for six people, so uh, you had to schedule a time that you had to take a shower. So the idea that uh, uh, my parents wanted all of us to do way, you know, to really have professional careers and be able to get two showers uh, was the goal. So um, it's I, the greatest, it's the greatest motivation, right? <laughs> to try yeah. to take a try Not to take a piece to make of an shit. appointment for shower. <laughs> Hell yeah. What, 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 what was, the, was the family supportive? Uh, yeah, my dad wanted me to be a lawyer. Both my brothers became lawyers. My sister became a a headhunter, all professionals. My dad wanted me to be a lawyer. I went to, um, I went to one year McGill, uh, which is a a big school in Canada, studying political science with an eye towards, uh, 
becoming a lawyer and I could not focus. Um, I didn't know at the time, I think I definitely had undiagnosed ADD and I think I just was not focused on uh, the end game, which was being a lawyer. I just didn't mm -hmm. have the, um, I just didn't think I had the brain for it. And uh, I would be, you know, taking, uh, you know, I'd be taking my class, I wouldn't be going to my classes, I'd be doodling on my books, I'd be writing poetry uh, under a tree on the campus. I, and I ultimately ended up switching to film school um, and um, did a couple of years at uh, a local film school in Canada called Concordia University. Um, I wrote a script uh, for a, a script writing class and um, I thought it was pretty good. My, my teacher didn't think it was very good, but I thought it was pretty good. Um, and I had read the, the year I wrote that script. I had I had read an article in in uh, uh, Life magazine, um, and it was like an entertainment issue. And uh, it talked about Steven Spielberg's company Amblin Entertainment, and it showed pictures of what it looked like. And um, and at the same time, I had read another article about Chris Columbus, who wrote Goonies and Gremlins, and that was in Rolling Stone magazine. And in the article was a um a story about his teacher i think it was uh, i think it was jesse cornblue was his teacher at nyu and i thought okay well i could do this i mean if if if, if jesse cornblue liked chris columbus's script so much and got him an agent and ultimately this guy started writing for spielberg i could do the same thing right yeah. <laughs> I, I thought well yeah, yeah. I'm naively thinking naively thinking well i wrote a script and it's it's pretty good uh little did i know it wasn't good at all i just you know i just was you know ignoring the obvious that it just was bad um but i ended up tracking down jesse cornbluth i called uh information in york tracked him down asked him uh begged him actually to read my script it took him about a month to read it and he said it's horrible and um but he said you show potential and uh, there's something there and you should probably keep at it. And that was the little sort of, that was that's the little spark. Yeah, that's yeah that I needed for somebody to think like, okay, well, maybe with a little practice and a little, you know, um, you know, grind this, this you may get it. Um, so I, um, I ended up uh, going to take a summer course at UCLA. A friend had recommended me taking a summer course there. Uh, and uh, so I went to LA with that script, by the way, uh, which I had rewritten. I had done a little bit of a pass on it, but I went to uh, UCLA, uh, took a course there. I think it was the summer course was eight classes. And I went to about three of them because uh, I was so like, I was so crazy about being in LA and seeing things and just experiencing, you know, the city that I just forgot about the classes. Uh, it's a lot. And, yeah. um, and then I realized the summer was coming to an end and uh, um, I needed to do something because I did not want to go back to school. Um, you know, my teachers at the time were not very supportive. You know, they were they were churning out artists and they thought I was I was writing entertainment, which was very different for them. Art and entertainment were two separate things. I was doing music videos and I was writing scripts about superheroes and that's not what they wanted. So I was scared of going back to school uh, and maybe graduating and ending up, you know, um, you know, looking for a job somewhere. So I thought I have this opportunity. I'm in LA. Uh, I'll look for about three or four weeks before uh, the summer was coming to an end. I would look for an internship and maybe make some connections um, that would help me uh, when I end up graduating. So I found on the UCLA had this board of internships and I found uh, a production company that was on the bus route uh down wilshire boulevard um so i and that was i didn't have a car i didn't have any way to travel so um i used to take this uh bus a couple days a week to this producer her name was faye schwab she had done a couple movies uh and uh i was answering phones for her and you know doing a bunch of you know different odds and ends for her and one day i was in the elevator 
with her and she said, what do you want to do? And I said, I want to write. And she said, do you have anything you've written? And I said, well, I just happen to have this screenplay. Um, that was the one I wrote that, you know, my teachers had said was horrible, that Jesse Cornblew said that it had some potential. Um, and I let her read it. I think she came back the next day and she said, this is pretty good. I'm going to option it. And uh, I'm not going to give wow. you any money, but I'm going to option it. And um, that was enough which that was enough for me to quit school. That was enough for me to quit school and move down to LA full time and really take a stab at writing as a career. Uh, yeah. So I left one year shy of graduating. My dad gave me 2,500 bucks. I came to LA, subletted a place um, and just wrote like a maniac, uh, one script after another. No more wild wood. Uh, what's that? No more wild wood. No, I had to. I unfortunately had to give up wild wood. I had to uh, give up <clears throat> those those summers in wild wood. I, 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 re I, I, but, I remember uh, we were we were in Hawaii, and he's telling me, yeah, you know, uh, you know, during the summers I would go work in Wildwood. New like, Jersey, Wildwood, Jersey. Jersey. Yeah, I used to go there all the time. <laughs> yeah, I work. Yeah. I work yeah. under the table. By the way, there was a big part of the story I I, I left out is. Uh, I'm Canadian, so the idea of coming to work in LA is in the States, that's unheard of. Like, you know, I didn't have a visa or anything. So my dad rode me down on his motorcycle uh, to Plattsburgh, New York, drove over the border. Uh, and uh, we said we were just going for a day drive. Um, and uh, uh, he would drop me off in, in Burlington. I took a, a plane to New York and then in New York to LA. Um, so I was illegal for a long time. Um, I guess it's statute of limitations or something. I could talk about it now, but uh, <laughs> it was illegal for um, for a, for a, a, a big part of the you know my first couple of years of living in LA and you know just writing script after script. And uh, ultimately, I had optioned one of the scripts I wrote, um, and then. I was, I had $167 in the bank. I was desperate. I had, I, I had read um, Shane Black's script for Lethal Weapon and I thought the writing was so spectacular that he had this very unique voice. And I, up until that point, I was, you know, literally mirroring every voice that I had heard. And mm -hmm. I was, I was writing to a tone that wasn't me. Um, and when I read Shane's script, I said, he he wrote with the freedom of, of like, of not stick, you know, I was so focused on, um, on, you know, writing a certain, thinking that this is the way you're supposed to be writing. And I didn't have a voice um, on the page. Um, and I decided I'm gonna write one more script uh, and then decide whether I, you know, I could stay or not, because again, I had $167 in the bank. So I came up with this idea and really it was based on the fact that a friend had lent me this cassette, uh, called dream of the blue turtles, uh, by sting. Uh, oh, yeah. and I had, a car. <laughs> yeah, you remember that? So I had, a, I, know I, had that. I had a car that didn't have a radio. So I put my boom box in the back seat. And um, so I had the cassette in there and my boom box was broken. So we kept replaying the same song over and over again. And that was Demolition Man. And there was wow. a line, and there was a line in that wow. song called Don't Mess Around with the Demolition Man. Mm -hmm. And I thought to myself, yeah. like, who is this Love. guy that you don't want to mess with? Um, and I sort of wrote, a st because it was like, it played like a metronome. Every day I would drive to my job. I hear that song over and over again, and it became this metronome. It, it became this thing that was playing in my head. Um, and at the same time, there was a um, there was a story about uh, Walt Disney being frozen, and that was on the cover of the National Enquirer. Oh, I remember that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you remember that? Yeah, yeah. cryogenically frozen. Yeah. I think yeah. he's still there. He's still there. <laughs> <laughs> he didn't go anywhere. So is Ted Williams, right? We haven't figured out how to reanimate so him is, yet. But so is Ted Williams, I think. I it, think just his head. Just his head. Just the head. It, it would be nice. Brain. It would be nice to get to meet him now. Um, <laughs> but 
I so Best I game. came up with a I came up with something that sort of was a marriage of things that I liked, you know, a cop, you know, something in the in the in the cop world and science fiction and you know, uh, chirogenics and um, so I came up with this pitch, and it was uh, right before Christmas, and uh, I had met, and this was through a cold call. This is I was very you know I was I was going to do anything to get my scripts read right back in the day. So uh, I had met an executive who worked for Joel Silver, uh, and I called her up to see if I could come pitch before Christmas time. She said, I don't have any slots open. I said, can I at least pitch you, you know, give me five minutes, let me pitch you this idea. And I pitched her Demolition Man. And, and I really like pitched my heart out. At the end of the call, she said, I don't get it. And uh, she said, Merry Christmas and hung up. And uh, oh, I was devastated. <laughs> uh, I know, I know wow. that feeling. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's happened many that times, by the way. Uh. Um, <laughs> And but then. it did introduce <laughs> the demolition man. Oh no, he's gonna get and, uh, there, and I want to know what happened uh, next. Okay, how long does it take I, to rebound from that? I want. I I just wanted to prove her wrong that the idea was solid. So I went to Florida. I went to go visit my parents uh, who were there for the winter, and uh, I saw them for about a week, um, and just buckled down and wrote the script in about two weeks. And uh, boom. Yeah. And uh, and I did it really to prove that the concept was was strong and um, and I didn't have an agent uh, at the time, but I showed it to an actor friend who showed it to an agent and the agent uh, took the script and sold it, had a bidding war, sold it to a company called Carolco. Um, I don't know if you remember them. Uh, uh, wow, I'm really dating myself. <laughs> <laughs> it's it was Andy Vanya's company, and anyways, they were they were pretty big. Like they did the Terminator Two sequel, and oh yeah, so they bought the script, and um, for a lot of money. And I I went from, you know, driving a salvage vehicle to now, uh, at least on paper, I was gonna you know have money to actually buy a car and and be able to eat more than one meal a day, and yeah. you know all of a sudden, and. The minute the script sold, the producer that I worked for, um, who I worked, you know, I was working answering phones um, uh, for, uh, came out and said that I, that was a work for hire because I was employed by her that anything I wrote under, you know, my oh, no. uh, employment, they own. So Fuck even that. though I- what? Wrote, yeah, so even though I wrote the script before work and after work, at lunchtime, it still she was claiming that it fell under the, um, you know, under the employment yeah. agreement that we had, which you know we didn't have an employment agreement. She paid me three hundred bucks every two weeks under the table. Um, that was the employment agreement. But so <clears throat> the minute Krolko found out that there were, you know, that there was it was going to be uh, uh, an issue that they would have to attach this other producer. They dropped the project, and um, ultimately, ironically, it ended up going back to Joel Silver, who I originally <laughs> pitched it to a year earlier, That's and he got uh, everybody paid off and got Warner Brothers to buy it, and and uh, it got made. Wow. And then all the money that they paid that producer came out of my fees, so I ended up making a real small amount of money on that movie. Um, and uh, but it 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 was you know. It was the greatest thing. It, it's um, having one hundred and sixty-seven dollars in the bank is a great motivation to uh, to do something uh, that could change your life, and it Absolutely. and it definitely did because it got me so many jobs after that, and people are still obviously still talking about that movie to, today. So, oh yeah, Legend, there's yeah. so much dump. Go into it. We're talking well, so much. Well, I, I mean, you introduced the world to Sandra Bullock. Mm -hmm. right. Well, you know, it's funny. There was another actress who was playing that role, and after a couple of days, they realized the chemistry wasn't working. And Sandra Bullock had just done a movie called Wrestling Ernest Hemingway, and she had a, a deal to do a second movie. And they literally, you know, within hours of looking at dailies, they just, you know, put her in the movie. Uh, wow. She wasn't originally Jeez. cast, That's but crazy. that Wrestling Ernest Hemingway movie, which she was really good in, they saw such potential for her. Um, that they put her in this in this movie, and uh, and she was obviously great in it. So great, 
Yeah, stranger things have happened. Oh, wow. yeah. It's, it's <laughs> weird how things play out. Yeah. You know? just, but so many predictions. So in many. <laughs> the power of foreshadowing right? here. It's insane. <clears throat> Everything is voice controlled. Board meetings with everyone on screens, hmm. Zoom. We're all Zoom. Okay, what are we Zoom. doing now? Is it? <clears throat> no physical contact, greeting, following, paying debt. I know. That, I used to love watching them shake hands in that movie where they would just put their everyone hands out and make circles. Jacked. No one's touching each other. Right? We we, 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 we don't have Wait. microchips tracking us, but everybody I got, has a cell I got phone. A phone. Which yeah, <laughs> that's a low jack. That's the same fucking shit, right? <laughs> well, how do you, wait a second. How do you know you don't have microchips tracking you? Fair enough. Hey, Fair enough. Who knows? I think maybe uh, that's what that second shot was. <laughs> <laughs> there it is. Yeah. The first shot is really for COVID. The second is the microchip. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, reference to Schwarzenegger being president. Well, well he came pretty know. close. <laughs> Not well, hang on. Back then, he was talking about politics. So Yeah. 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 That wasn't a stretch. No. And I love everything else, the limitations on people. Like when they would, I, I still make this joke. Like when my, one of my kids messes up and they curse, I'll just be like, John Spartan, you are fined one credit for violation of the verbal morality. <laughs> 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 These things hold up over time. It's amazing. That's uh, fun. Um, the three seashells, everybody uses that now, don't they? Oh, of course. Uh, no one knows how to use them, but we, we, we use the reference. But I mean, <laughs> where do you start? I, I went down a wormhole, okay? When I knew we were interviewing Peter, I went down a wormhole, okay? <laughs> and I actually found out that there are several different theories of how to use the three seashells. And the, the one wow. I found actually had illustrations, and it said you take the first, this is rough, they said you take the first two seashells and you use them as chopsticks to collect the fecal matter together. <laughs> And then when that's done, you take the third seashell to clean up the remainder. Now, the one thing that people, first of all, that's insane. But the one thing I don't understand is people are then disposing of these seashells in the toilet. I don't, I don't get that. I don't know a toilet that can handle these seashells. you need to take a pot. Of it. It's a futuristic <laughs> toilet. You got a garbage I just love it. that there's people out there figuring out how to do this. It's amazing. <laughs> You know, it's a good, yeah. it's sort of a good lesson as a writer, right? To create some kind of mystery that people will talk about for 30 years. But we'll, yeah. we'll look at imagination. I, know. I mean, to sit down and think, I, I, look, I've always said it, you know, writing is, I wish I had that discipline. Uh, we, we spoke personally too. You're like, you know, you should write something, you know, a, a, a show. I have the ideas. I, I just... It's just a discipline I don't have, Karen. You have it. You do it. You have the animated movie coming. You know, you're putting together the animated movie, uh, Pierre the Pigeon Hawk. You sat down. <clears throat> you wrote this thing. You created this world. Peter's done it. Time's over. Um, well, I understand where, where Peter comes from. He I, talks I, about, I, I can understand yeah. it. Um, I just wish I could do it. When, he, just... when he talks about the ADHD, like, you know, before, I mean, I, he, you know, when we grew up, there was really nobody discussing or diagnosing ADD or ADHD. And I used to read things and while I was reading them, while I was reading words in school, my mind would be somewhere else. That's the problem. Recreating, yeah. that, that was it, I would disappear. So right. writing is like, when you can sit there and you can let your mind go crazy, that's the only, it's... having like writing for someone who has ADD, ADHD, it's an incredible escape from the craziness that goes oh, on in your imagine. brain. I would imagine. Yeah, I, I, yeah. And I also, I also wanted to go back to that, Peter, um, there are so many people in the business that are writers, showrunners, who were lawyers. They were well, lawyers. Yeah, they would. They they have and a they law became degree, writers. and and they. I, 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 every time I I you know we you know you wind up having conversations with them, and I just didn't like waking up in the morning, and I didn't like being a lawyer. Can mm -hmm. you blame them? And uh, <laughs> Nick Santora is one of them. Uh, he was a lawyer and then, you know, started writing, uh, wrote a spec script for like Sopranos. And then next thing you know, doing prison break. Yep. And, you, you know, it's, uh, I, I guess you find your calling later. You know, when you're doing your, you what know, you love, it's not, not work. But think about how many people don't take that leap. Scary. I mean, people Fear. are doing their jobs and they're miserable and they could be actors, they could be writers, they could be musicians, they could be composers, they could be in all different parts of the arts. 
well, Peter said he was, you know, naive that he jumped into this writing thing. But however, but he that's courageous important, to do that. Yeah. He also had an important component. He yep. had a family that supported him. Mm -hmm. That's important. And that's super important. I could tell you, coming from, I'm, I'm, I'm first generation American, so a lot of that generation came from it. Mm -hmm. It's work, or you go to school, it's work. Yeah. Do you know how many times I had to leave a job because they wouldn't let me out on an audition? Yeah. I needed to go, and I'm like, yeah, I'll see you later. Uh, I'll find another job tomorrow. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. You know, because I could always dig a hole. Yeah. You know, I might not be able to wait tables. Uh, but because I, I was fucking horrible. But, uh, <laughs> Wait a minute, you um, waited table? I hit, yeah. Oh, we got don't. We gotta get I really <laughs> didn't like uh, being around people. <laughs> you know, and uh, so I'd rather I would usually find jobs to um, I had some horrible jobs, but you know, jobs where I could just do, you know, work with my hands, yeah. which I like to do, and. And they know I wanted to be an actor, and and you know sometimes I had to leave, and I would just make it up on the weekends and do overtime and that kind of thing. Yeah. And it and it and we talked about this on some of the other podcasts. Somebody put some of the other guests. It requires sacrifice. Yeah. Think. Look at the things that you had to do, Peter. You know. Boom box in the back of the car. The car didn't have a radio. You had to take a job. A person paying you under the table, then trying to fuck you later on, which is with the money. Very Los Angeles. Angeles. Very Los Sick. Angeles. <laughs> yeah, but you, you, you know, you, you you have to navigate those choppy waters sometimes. You know, and it's it's um, and this is for people who are trying to get into the business and and have this have these preconceived notions of of what it is. The reality is, it takes sacrifice, it takes persistence, and at the same time, trying to find the balance with patience, which I don't have a lot of. Hmm. Um, till this day, I, I always want to work. I always want to work. If I'm uh -huh. not working a month, I'm, I think uh, I think uh, every everything is crumbling down, and and uh, it's just because uh -huh. for me, just like when Peter. When his, his friends were listening to records and he was writing his poetry, that, and I, you know, I'm not a psychologist here, but that's therapy for him. Mm -hmm. And me yeah. auditioning, working on a character, building a character, trying to find all these different colors, that's my therapy. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> and, um, you but made it, you question know. question for you uh peter at what point did you have a conversation with what was it like when that project went back to jill silver and you got to reconvene with the people who passed on your idea originally well yeah. the executive who passed on it it wasn't there anymore so i didn't get to gloat oh. but uh, i don't i don't think i <laughs> i uh you know look to be honest what's the time frame in, what's that What's the time frame from Christmas? To About, I, I, uh, from Carolco to Warner Brothers was a, yeah. a year. We started yeah. going to deposition. Gone. An executive gone, gone in a year. year. Yeah. Gone. Yeah. Yeah. And she, it was later. a long term, long, long term, uh, uh, long term business. Uh, that was, that was, uh, that I picture. But to be honest, I don't think I did a good, when, now that I think about it, uh, I don't know if I did a good job pitching. I probably didn't. Uh, and it probably was so convoluted that she had every right to say no. Um, but in my mind, I saw the movie. I, I saw it. I just felt like I got to sit down and write this thing. And that was going to be my lethal weapon. That was going to be in my voice. Uh, I even, you know, it's so interesting. I, I, when I had the script sent out, uh, it, w it said Demolition Man written by 2EXL308. And that was my license plate number because <laughs> because I didn't want anybody in the business confusing Peter Lenkoff, the guy who was an assistant to a producer. I didn't oh. want them, con I wanted them to read the script as if it's this sort of mystery writer, as if it's this, um, per, you know, somebody who uh, is really a professional and not a guy who's answering phones and, you know, and, um, 
and uh, getting coffee at a production company. I love so that. Um, there was a little bit, that little mystery, I think also helped, it got people to read it right away because it went out with a very, you know, sort of interesting cover page. Uh, and I think that helped. Wow, so um, cryptic. Yeah, you know, Dom, I wanna go back to something you said about, you know, uh, I, think, I think that I definitely was very naive, but I think that what the biggest fear for me was, what I'd be doing if I wasn't writing. And there were so many signs that told me to pack it up and go home. You know, I had gotten a job moving beds at the AFM. You had to go to Santa Monica and move mattresses out of rooms so those rooms could become offices for the AFM. Mm -hmm. And on my way there, they were paying me $125. On my way there, guy hit me, didn't have insurance. The cost of the action was five hundred dollars. So I was, I lost three hundred and fifty dollars that day. That should have been a sign. Go home. Uh, my car, my salvage vehicle. Now I didn't. I wasn't smart enough to look at the pink slip when I bought the car, and it said SLVG. I didn't know what that meant. Um, but one day the transmission was busted, and I had to go from La Cienega and Wilshire all the way to Hollywood Boulevard and Serrania um in reverse and it took me oh, two hours yes I, <laughs> true true story i would make a drive note a of that in the time the time because that's that's gonna be a clue. Well, reverse the work oh, in reverse I drive a block stop you pretend pull the that chess I'm looking for what's that you pulled the chess palmetary yes. <laughs> sunny I love it. You're Backing stopping. Up the car. You're pretending that you're looking for parking spots. I was like, that's <laughs> for fucking for a parking spot. Then I would drive another block. I didn't have the money. First of all, I couldn't leave the car overnight at the office. You weren't allowed to. And I didn't have the money to get it fixed or get it towed. So I drove it back uh, to um, where, my apartment that I was staying at, parked it outside, uh, and then started taking the bus to work until I got money to fix the car. And the day after I parked it outside, I come outside and the window smashed. Oh, wow. So again, so many All signs. The signs. That, and they, and yeah, they, stole, that, they stole the boom box. <laughs> no, I would take the boom box. I would take the boom box out at night. I bring it in because, and I would actually, I, after my car, the, the window got smashed, I used to leave my windows down because I just figured, <laughs> It's easier to, um, you know, it's easier just to have them go through the car if they wanted something than uh, than get a window. Right, yeah, uh, <laughs> you don't have to fix window. the window. Yeah, smart. <laughs> no radio. I mean, what are they going to take? Now, Dom, we uh, you got to share this because again, just to to you know segue from the demolition man, right? Um, Dom, this. Oh uh, yeah, yeah. This is great. So there's uh, there's a it was a. a a great article by Mick LaSalle. Uh, he said, uh, Demolition Man anticipates a future in which one half of the population is humorless, delicate, and too politically correct to breathe, while the other half is perpetually enraged and glorifying in its own pristine ignorance. That's, yeah. I mean, that's, that's pretty... A great, uh, that's a great take on where that movie was Nostradamus. made and that world that, they, that he <laughs> painted and the world that we're living in now. Yes. It's not far off. Almost 30 years ago, you imagine, 1993, that movie came out. Yeah, I mean, I mean you know, the irony and all that. Well, you think it's actually been 30 years because it was written a couple of years before yeah. that. So, yeah, so, yeah. It seemed wow. so insane at the time. And now yeah. it's not that far off crazy so yeah but so then you 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 go off and you write on your your uh you're writing on 24 right yeah that was there was a big gap in between you know demolition man which i sold i think i was like 24 years yeah, old sold other movies uh, and yeah yeah there was other uh i did a lot of rewrites i did some pilots uh um uh, I did um, La Femme, a show called La Femme Nikita, which was really my first TV job. The old La Femme Nikita, not the one that you guys know. Oh, no, I was, in, I was in high school. I, I watched, sometimes I'd watch it late at night and it may or You're may not have been muted. Going through puberty. <laughs> <laughs> you would use a Rene. 
<laughs> I've heard that before, actually. <laughs> That's funny. Um, yeah, so there's, yeah, and then I, um, so the, the, Joel Cernow, who created 24, sorry, who created 24, also created La Femme Nikita, uh, and I worked with him for a number of years, and uh, when he um, was doing 24, he uh, was kind enough to invite me uh, on that and show as an EP. What so. season? What season of uh, 24 did you work I think on? it was season four. Okay. Uh, so yeah, season I, you weren't there when I got there. Well, when I did that. No, but, no. Okay. No, I was there. I was only there for a season, and then I went to um, CSI New York, which mm -hmm. uh, I, I ended up on that show for about six years. You know, it's interesting about 24. 24, I looked at it like the Yankees. Uh, you, there, everybody on that staff was an executive producer. There were no staff writers, uh, and they were all like heavy hitters. You know, Howard Gordon, and there was Steve Cronish, and uh, Joel, and uh, Bob Cochran. They were all guys that had their own shows um and uh and then me and uh i really learned so much from them and um and it was a it was pretty amazing because each one of them you know could could carry or run their own show and it was just this bullpen of of like yankee greats that you would go and work with every day it was it was a lot of fun mm -hmm. amazing show how did the remake for Hawaii Five-O come, come about? And how, how was that presented to you? Or did you present that to, to CBS? I, um, no, that was, uh, so I, I had, the year before I had written a, uh, a pilot um, for like uh, what I thought was like a rock and roll Quincy type of show. Um, and, uh, and- You know and Quincy? Studio, Hold on, Peter. You guys you know Quincy? He doesn't know Quincy. I don't know Quincy. Quincy. He doesn't know Quincy. Don't dog. shame me for not knowing Quincy. Yeah, I'm gonna send it to you. I knew I La Nick. I knew La Femme Nick. You said you're ninety percent sure. <laughs> it's gonna read ten percent. <laughs> I should say. So I. This is sort of hip take on a on a porn, <laughs> on a medical examiner show. I and loved actually, that show, Peter. What's that? I loved Quincy. <laughs> yeah, I loved too. watching the rerun. I mean, I wasn't I was a little kid when it when it aired, but I, the reruns I, I I remember I bought all the seasons on Amazon oh, and watching God. them, but I remember <laughs> watching them as a little kid when they were on and I I I always loved Jack Klugman because I remember him Odd from Couple. Odd Couple yeah. and which was on WPIX yeah. at 11 o'clock every day. <laughs> WPIX Channel yeah. 11. Yeah. <laughs> Except if there was a Yankee game on, but uh, it was a great show. Yeah. Well, anyways, I so I wrote this script for CBS. Uh, they liked it. They had put me um, together with Alex, uh, who played uh, McGarrett on Five O. So I had met Alex on this medical examiner show, and um, and James Mangold, uh, who just did. Um, uh, Ford versus Ferrari. He was attached mm -hmm. as the director. Uh, he did Logan. Mm -hmm. um, and we met with Alex to maybe play the corner. And uh, ultimately, the show didn't go. Um, and then I was at a CBS party. And uh, there was an executive there who said, uh, you know, we really love that script. And sorry, we didn't make that script. But uh, we're starting to talk about development for next year. And we're talking about taking another stab at Hawaii Five-0. Um, and I know that they had spent a couple of seasons developing, trying to get a script that they were going to go forward with, but I guess the latest script they uh, were not going to move forward with. So they were going to start all over again uh, with a new script. And they said, would you be interested in pitching? And I said, yeah. I, they said, do you know the show? And I said, it was my dad's favorite show. I remember very, you know, faintly, vaguely, these moments where my dad would sit in front of the TV eating grapes or a bowl of ice cream, and I would sit by his knee. Uh, and I remember the palm trees, and I remember, you know, you know, I remember sort of some of the, you know, the landscape, but I knew how important the show was to him. Because, you know, when you uh, grow up in Montreal, and you really have two seasons, winter and July, uh, the, idea of going, <laughs> the idea of going away um, to Hawaii, even though it's on a TV, the idea of that escapism was very meaningful to him. Oh, I so I thought I would love to do that show and bring it back. 
and bring it back in the same way it was meaningful to my dad to say, I would bring it back to say, you know, the same way where it'd be meaningful to other people that um, maybe can't get to a place like Hawaii, uh, but could live vicariously through the characters week to week. So um, I, and now it wasn't, you know, didn't, they didn't just hand me it. They said, okay, come in and pitch. And I put together a, a pitch um, and really sort of drilled down into what I thought was missing from the original show, which, you know, again, in its day, it was such a popular show and it's, uh, it's you know, it was on for 12 years and the idea of trying to live up to that is, is daunting. And, um, but I thought if I could come at it from character um, and, uh, and make that the sort of the, the uh, foundation of the show uh, and not worry about the cases, um, I, I may be able to do something that could last. And, uh, so I really spent all my time working on who the characters were. Um, and, uh, I went in and I, again, I also want to give the, the pilot some meaning, some, some, you know, um, cause I'd always wondered like what brought Jack Lord to Hawaii or, you know, you know, Dano, you know, he clearly wasn't born on the island. So what got him there? So I wanted to answer those questions. Um, and I went in and I pitched it and they liked it enough to commission a script and wrote the script. Like a, uh, like a serial you know, component to the show, right? It's a, what's it's that? An, like a, a serialized component to the show, which some, some of the stories carry over. Yeah, for sure. It's, it's not a case of the week kind of, kind mm -hmm. of, kind of, kind of thing. I, I, well, you know, I know you did that with Magnum. Yeah, with yeah, Magnum. we tried to do a lot of like, you know, closed ended, which, you know, the sort of like there was a, a, case, a case of the week, but there was a lot of threads that were serialized threads that went, you know, Mythology. for years. Yeah. Uh, and um, yeah, and, and it just sort of, you know, I delivered the script and uh, things came to get, you know, we got a great, you know, great director and casting was everything you know i feel like if i uh, you know i could have wrote the greatest script in the world i wrote you know i think a decent script but really what made the thing come alive or made it last 10 years was the casting it was everybody was cast so well um i you know interesting enough i i was really writing the first person to be cast was daniel a kemp um and i started writing that character chino kelly to daniel but I originally, that character was going to be more like Sean Connery in The Untouchables. He was going to be sort of like the wise uncle, um, the elder statesman of the team. Uh, and then I got a call one day when I was writing the script and, and they said, uh, Daniel DeCam is in town. He'd like to meet with you. And, um, and he came in my office and, and said, I know you're doing Hawaii Five-0. I'd love to be a part of it. Uh, my kids really love uh, the island. They love their school. Uh, our home is there. Um, and we had this great meeting. And at the end of it, I we said goodbye. And I went back to writing the script. And I found myself writing to Daniel. And uh, I think, you know, uh, uh, that meeting changed that character in a very significant way um, and made it so much better. Um, because I, again, I think the casting for that show was everything. That's what made the show. I, I've been very lucky casting wise because I think, you know, the shows that I've been involved in have always had really strong casts. And, um, and that's sort of, you know, people say, what's the secret sauce? Um, it's not the, it's not my writing. Cause I always said, I'm not the best writer. I'm the hardest working writer. I think it's the casting. And I think, you know, when you get, you know, good people to say your words, uh, that's gold. And uh, I've been blessed. I've been very lucky. Yeah. And Adam, right. that's why that's why I've come to you a few times. Come to the well a couple times. So I had a great time. I had a great time doing Magnum going out there. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I mean, I, 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 I remember I, I you sent me uh, a, a, you, you got my email. And you sent me an email. It's like, hey, you know, I'm doing, you know, this pilot. I want to play this uh, character as part of the mythology. I said, man, 
this guy reached directly out to me. I can't say no. I got to go do it. Mm-hmm. And and uh, and I rem- I remember Magnum. I I love. I I remember watching Magnum. Okay. I I knew exactly who he was talking about. Mm-hmm. The whole Vietnam. The guy comes back, puts the thing. The, uh, the bandana <laughs> on, Nuzo. I, I knew exactly who he was talking. I was like, I have to do this. And then we became friends and the rest is history. But to make... Tom, I'll tell you something. If you if you ever watch the pilot for 5.0, everything is around the death of McGarrett's father. The, the entire series was uh, built on the foundation of McGarrett coming home because of the death of his father. And that traumatic experience changed his life and put him on this course that started the task force. Nuzo, the character you played, had a very similar impact on the vision, you know, the vision that I had for the show, which was Nuzo's death was going to be a huge part of these guys and their lives going forward. Uh, in 5.0, and now I'm, I'm giving away something that is not formulaic. It may sound like it, but there was a uh, there was a connection between father and son that that show was about. And that really, and I'm talking about 5.0, because it was about me and my father watching that show. So the series, you know, when I brought it back, it was really grounded in the idea of a father and his son. Magnum was always about friendship. And Clearly. it was always, about, yeah. And so you're the catalyst for everything. And the idea of Nuzo being, you know, being the sort of catalyst of the, of their, in, in their lives and, and the, what changed them and moved them and um, was everything. And the Nuzo was a big part of it. I mean, Nuzo was a big part of the original show also. I just felt that was a, a no brainer in terms of what, uh, uh, puzzle pieces you bring to the the new you know new version it, of the it, show. It was really cool because a lot of a lot when when Nuzo was brought in uh, first, I got to work with every work with all those guys, and we had, we always had a blast. But uh, it was always these flashbacks to when they were uh, in the war, mm-hmm. you know, and um, some really good moments. Um, tough because I would fly in I, I don't know if you're aware of this Peter because I think only maybe once or twice you were actually in Hawaii when I was there I would fly in not a big flyer not a big flyer no, not a big oh, I, that, that part. <laughs> and um, I would fly in and I would be taking directly to wardrobe so now this is a 13 14 hour flight now I'm, I'm looking to go to sleep. I'm hot. It just the, the, I don't sleep on the plane, and and the everybody like, yeah you get to go to Hawaii you know yeah it's, it's, <laughs> and I'm like yeah but I got to get off a plane go to wardrobe <laughs> then try to go stay awake so because I'll be I'm definitely working the next morning and I would work the next day the next day and let me tell you. I didn't really give a shit. I had such a great time, man. That's awesome. I had such a great time <laughs> with OJ and and uh, Purry and and, and 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 the maniac and Steven <laughs> and um, I just I I loved being there. I I love doing that show, playing that character. And we I, had such a good time. I I, I, I have to thank you for that. You know. Oh uh, no, th- I have to thank you for that because I. The fact that I got you to play Nuzo and the opportunity to bring Nuzo back and the opportunity to make Nuzo a part of that, the legacy of the show, I mean, that was everything to me. But I want to say that we had such a great time during the pilot. We went away Turtle for Bay. that. You remember, we went away to Turtle Bay and it was like you, me, Zach, uh, Steven, and, uh, and, and we stayed um, We stayed in that one suite. Um, yep. And uh, it was that was that was great. That yeah, was great. And, yeah, uh, it was such a great yeah. time. Such a great. Yeah, time. it was a lot of fun. And uh, I really, uh, you know, I love you, Don. So that was a great treat for me to spend that quality time with you. Ah, uh, <clears throat> I, uh, I, I I look back on it all the time, you know. And uh, I, I'm surprised they didn't make you work the minute you landed. I uh, the fact that they. <laughs> 
brought you to wardrobe and let you work the next day. That's uh, that was pretty generous. <laughs> you lucky they didn't make me work. That you gotta day, do a better job been sleeping through those scenes. You gotta do a better job I'm, scheduling your flight. No, I, 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 I'll never forget this. So we, we the pilot. I was so fucking tired. That's a long flight. I, I just, I was Fuck so that. tired. And I remember going to sleep. And then I woke up at 1130. <laughs> and I'm looking on the balcony and I'm looking at, I, I was staying at the hotel to see the harbor. The boat, it was like so beautiful. And I'm thinking to myself, fuck, <laughs> they're picking me up at 430. <laughs> <laughs> I got it. I'm in every scene, no, I so I know I'm doing a 13 hour day. <laughs> um, and I got through that first day, but I got to tell you, I, I had a great time because we had the ceremony when we were doing the yeah. pilot the first day. I shot the first day. We were shooting the scene on yeah. the stage and at the, uh, the POW camp. Yeah. I was like, wow, this is great. I had such a great time, yeah. such a great experience for me. How long were you I out there? Remember for? Jay's I probably win. never I went remember to Hawaii Jay's. if it wasn't for Peter. Oh, really? I, yeah, if it wasn't for Peter. You never went. Be, I, it's too fucking far, man. <laughs> you don't even want to fly to friggin'. There's uh, no train that goes yeah. to Hawaii. <laughs> I, I, I love Australia. Yeah. You, you, ain't, you, ain't you ain't going there. You ain't going to see any pictures of Dom holding a koala. Any movies in Australia? <laughs> if I got to do a movie, if I got to do a movie, I, I'll suck it up. But no. uh, it's. Uh, no. Well, you, you gave me the greatest gift, Dom. Um, you really did. That character oh, was fully realized. The character was great, and That's I so... think you really cared in that pilot. Uh, and you, you, you knew what the you know how great a loss uh, your character was to to the other characters. I mean, it was really, really, really a huge thing for the show. Now I just want to ask just one question because yeah. it's like. We love this show because we get to interview people that are, you know, either behind the scenes or right, you know, in front of the camera all this time. And we get to meet the real people. <clears throat> you know, we get to show the world who these folks are and what drives them, where they started from and where they got to. And in this day and age where there's this, you know, it's so much about cancel culture and people just read articles. They don't get to know people about for who they are. Right. They read the articles and they make their judgments. Now, you had such an amazing run at CBS running all these shows. And then this giant bomb gets dropped in your lap last year. Right. And now our guests are getting to listen and know who you are and figure out, you know, the kind of person you are. Right. But what is that experience? What has that meant for you that you've gone through over the last year? Well, it's a good question. And I really, you know, I haven't really talked about it uh, since it happened. And um, it's humbling. It's scary. Um, you know, you spend uh, every, you know, every free moment thinking about it. Um, look, here's the thing. I, I had an amazing career. Uh, I was so lucky. I mean, the fact that I got to work as long as I got into work and, and done something that I love truly love. I wish I had a hobby that I loved as much as writing and I don't. It's so pathetic. Yeah. Um, I love <laughs> it's great. I, I, I love what I do. Um, and, you know, I hit a brick wall at 100 miles an hour last year. Uh, I was blindsided. <clears throat> but, you know, I also have to look and, you know, you spend a lot of time reflecting. I, I uh, actually for the first time in my whole life, I had time to actually talk to a therapist, go for walks with friends and better understand myself. Now, I was definitely a, a tough boss. I demanded excellence from people. I was a serial micromanager. Um, I, it took me uh, way too long to learn how to delegate. Um, and that's frustrating for people. You know, it takes yeah. away their power when you're making all the decisions and you're rewriting all the scripts and you're saying no to every idea that comes through the door. That's frustrating for people. Um, and, you know, I never really took that into account. I just wanted to keep, you know, the, the machine moving. Um, and uh, I did what I thought I needed to do to keep the show going. Um, and I, um, 
in hindsight now, there's so many things I could have done better. Um, but I know I was, I was a tough boss. I had, you know, I had a, you know, most of the time, 90, you know, 95% of the time an idea came into the room, into my room, uh, and I would, I would pass on it. Uh, I was very specific with the stories I wanted to tell. Um, and, um, and, you know, it was just, that was the way it was. And, uh, I, you know, I rewrote, uh, I didn't have the patience, I think, to, um, allow people to get their scripts to a place where, um, they could go before the cameras. I would, I would probably, you know, uh, for the most part, after one, two drafts, I would take the script away and I'd rewrite it. I just, I should have had more patience for that. Things that I I did, I think I did, and I didn't um, know what the what you know what the long term effects were of them. Um, you know, the thing that hurt me the most because I know I know I was a tough boss. You know, it's not like somebody didn't say you know Peter's a tough boss. Um, so I knew that I was aware of that. Uh, I knew that my expectations were high. Um, I knew that I, you know, look, I'm not perfect uh, by far. There's so many mistakes I made uh, uh, in my career, um, but I always tried. Uh, and, you know, the article that was in Vanity Fair didn't talk about all the people that got their breaks, all the assistants that got their first scripts, yeah. uh, all the good, because that's yeah. that's not a story. Um, <clears throat> no. um, every you know everybody that you know uh, uh moved up um that started as a pa that became a writer or you know moved up from assistant editor to editor all the there's 900 people that work for me not 30 900 um you know the thing that got me through uh this whole experience was everybody that reached out uh, the crew who I still talk to regularly, the cast who I talk to regularly of all the you know the shows, that really helped. But I had to spend a lot of time, you know, and I even went obsessively through emails just to see what what did I do and how did I do it wrong. Um, and I'm learning so many lessons uh, with regards to you know the mistakes I made. But the thing I was going to go back to this, the thing that that really hurt me the most was the issue that Lucas, uh, the, the guy who played MacGyver, yeah. who had said that uh, during the first season of the show that I had made fun of his legs, that I had body shamed him. And that's the thing that killed me because, you know, Lucas was told that by a third party. Um, I worked with him for four years. The idea of that, and again, his feelings are so important here. The idea that he lived thinking that I said that for four years and never said anything, that kills me. Yeah. Because if you look at my social media, uh, I treated him like a little brother. He was, I was a champion of him. Uh, I even hired his manager who had one client, which was Lucas. I hired his manager uh, in his office. His manager's office was about 20 steps from mine to make sure that I had a direct line to Lucas and and that I made sure that, because look, doing a show, being the lead of a show is really tough. Mm -hmm. um, and the idea of knowing uh, when there's gonna be a problem or anticipating a problem, that's the key to good, you know, keeping the show going. So the manager really was in my ear daily um, and he worked for me. So the manager worked for me. So I knew what was going on day to day. And I had never heard about this situation. I feel that if I knew that he had felt that way and he said it happened season one, I think I could have gone, flown down to Atlanta, had a conversation with him and we could have resolved that, that you know, w with a hug and, and, you know, a dinner and, and it would have been over. But, you know, what kills me is that he, you know, thought I said that and, and lived with it for four seasons and um, finally, you know, finally spoke up about it. Um, and um, so that's, you know, that's, you know, the, the other stuff that's, you know, that's, you know, the price you pay for making mistakes. Uh, that the thing with Lucas, that's, that's the thing that hurt me the most because I was really blindsided. You know, we were really super close for so long. 
Um, and that's the one that came completely out of the blue. Uh, and, um, you know, I still, you know, I, you know, I still can't, you know, wrap my head around it because I, I feel like, you know, the idea of living, thinking your boss, you know, made fun of you, you know, that's hurtful. Um, I get it. Um, I just wish that I had known so we could have resolved it, you know, yeah. four years ago. Yeah. An open line of communication would have. Uh... Yeah. And I, yeah. I'd say. That's why I, I, I that's why I hired the manager. Well, you that's know, it's what like, he th that's what he thought he had. Yeah. yeah well. Yeah. You know, remember, remember in, in Raiders of Lost Ark, the. They said that the uh, Ark of the Covenant was a, uh, a direct uh, line to God, you know. Uh, so uh, the manager was my direct line to uh, to Lucas. Mm -hmm. So anything that was an issue, any problems, anything that I could do, um, uh, that was my conduit, and um, and it was all great until I found out that this was an issue that he. Um, you know that he lived with and thought that I had said so. Have you have um, you have you reached out to Lucas? Yeah, I sent a I I talked to his manager and you know I sent him an apology and uh, again I. You know, look, it's I don't know if it's it's um. It's hard because I think that once you go on the record and you say something like that, and then the next thing you're friends with somebody, I don't know if that's a good look. So I think for him, uh, he knows that I'm sorry. Uh, he knows that um, it's something that I, you know, I wish we had resolved, you know, some time ago. Uh, his manager knows that as well. And, um, and it is what it is. You know, I think, um, you know, I was thinking about, writing an op-ed about the experience and uh, um, because, you know, we've had so many exchanges over, over the years and we were so close and something like this, you know, really could have been resolved. Um, but uh, look, I, at some point, I hope we could get back to the, you know, the place we were. And, um, and I think that, um, I think that, uh, you know, it's a huge, you know, it's a huge lesson. I, I probably had blinders on and there's probably signs that I could have seen that I didn't see. And, um, I mean, and you know, had a lot going on, Peter. I mean, I mean yeah, yeah. yeah it, it, there yeah. was. Yeah, but, I'm, not, know, I'm not making any excuses, but, I, you know, it seems like he's a very, you know, he wants this, these shows to get done and done properly. And. You know, I, I'm that I'm a lot like that, as Dom knows. I'll put people's emotions to the side because I know what's important to me is getting this stuff done. Um, so I totally get where he's going with yeah. all the stress that he's under. Yeah, I it's just honestly, yeah, go ahead. you know, the job is constantly putting out these fires day to day, and things slip through the cracks. Um, and you know, you could say something that's you know that could be interpreted a certain way, or you could do something that's interpreted a certain way. You know, I used to come in the office and go straight to my office. A lot of times I didn't say hi to anybody because I'd either, you know, be focused on the first phone call that I have to make, you know, and I realize now that that's, you know, that sends a message, that sends a signal. Um, you know, everything you do um, yeah. is, is you know, is, is, is looked at, every action you do. Um, you know, I, you know, I made mistakes. I kept people too long. I, you know, I, I just did, I, I, the list is, is endless. Um, mm. And that's what I spent the last, you know, 11 months thinking about and working through is how did I get to this place? But, you know, the fact that I got to work for 30 years, you know, I think I got in the guild in 89. So I was, you know, it's been a, it's been a while. What is that? 32 years. Um, <laughs> Gummy bite I'm people. just lucky for that. I, I, you know, I, you know, I'm not angry. I'm not bitter. I understand that, you know, the world has changed and, uh, uh, I need to change with it. So, well, yeah. I just, honestly, I thank you so much for just talking about it. I love, yeah. I love getting the insight from people who are behind these articles and these stories and just what people will get from hearing this even before we brought this up is that, you know, when you're talking about your early pitches with demolition and other things, you have a life pattern of looking back at the things you've done and saying, you know, I could have done that better or maybe I could learn from that. It's about growth. So everything yeah. I'm getting from you is growth 
and the world is changing and the climate is changing so even now like you have time to reflect on this and how you know what you did right what you did wrong you just want to be a better person and learn from it you know what i mean and so that's amazing that's yeah, amazing is, yeah, that's and that's all problem. we're all trying to do is yeah. learn from our yeah. mistakes we Everybody all, we makes all have mistakes. A, we all have a fucking yeah. closet full of of things we could have done differently and we're just not all having articles written about us you know what i mean it's like we're not right. all under a microscope so it's just nice that you would share that with us and uh we appreciate well, it well I'll, I'll leave you with one other thing about that you know, one of the actors on uh, Five O said to me when this whole thing happened, he said, "You know, people, these people think they're doing something to you, but they're doing something for you." And it did it, that didn't land with me at first. And what I realized over time, and in all the reflecting, and getting to sort of reconnect with my family, something that I really was, you know, not very good at because I was so busy the idea of taking walks with one of my sons every afternoon. And yeah. I realize that it's, it is something for me because it, you know, like you said, you, it makes you a better, this kind of experience, this trauma, if you process it the right way, makes you a better person. And I think allows you to grow in ways you never would have grown. If I was on that hamster wheel, I, I used to say this, I said, I was going to either die of a heart attack in my car on the way to the studio. Cause it was an hour drive each way or die writing one of these procedural scripts. Um, and that would have been really sad. <laughs> and I think that I needed to grow as a human being. I needed to sort of take this time to, to like reflect on the things I was doing right, the things I was doing wrong. And I think this, as bad as it is, and I don't wish this for anybody for it to ever happen to somebody, but you know, when I look back at the year, I've grown so much i've learned so much i've connected with my family and friends and i've i've i think i've learned how to be a a better human being and a more well-rounded human being and i well, don't I, know. I, I i i follow you on twitter obviously and and it's anybody who's listened to this follow peter on on twitter and and you you you, you see it's all, all about his family it's all about his kids it's all about Wyatt's garage. It's all about. Um, <laughs> it is. It, it, it it's is. Good. It's it's yeah. family trips, trips here, trips there. What his sons are doing. Yeah. What his daughters are doing. Enjoy it. Uh, it that's, that's that's all it, it is. It's, that's all it is. And uh, they're lucky to have you. Yeah, it's great. I'm lucky to have them. I know. I know. Yeah, both I'm ways. very lucky. You no, know, they're so supportive. You know, I'll tell you so, one other thing. I got to tell you this because. It really like it. It was. Uh, it, it real. I think it got me through the first twenty four hours of the whole experience. You know, I didn't realize it was going to be a big deal. Uh, when it when it got in in the trades and everything, I real. I didn't realize. Like I just thought, hey, I'm just a writer. You know, it's not gonna. It's not gonna. No one's gonna know. But it it got in the trades. It was like an, it picked up by all these different publications. Peter Lenkoff gets gets canned from CBS uh accused of a toxic work environment um and i thought okay i gotta figure out that first day i gotta figure out how to tell my kids and what to do and i'm scrambling i'm talking to you know uh my agents and lawyers and friends and all these people and my son what my youngest son sends me a, a text that says are you okay and then a green puke emoji uh. And I said, I said, and I wrote back, why? And as soon as I said that, I realized why. And I ran upstairs and I realized that he somehow found out and what he had a Google alert for my name. Mm. So that thing was going off at like noon mm. that, you know, the, the day after I got, I got canned that day was going off like crazy. So my wife and I brought the two boys, my girls were not around, but we brought the two boys into a room and we said, we were going to tell them what happened. And my wife says, uh, well, look, you know, it's, you're going to read this. There's going to be a lot of things that are said. And my older son, who was uh, 14 at the time, says, mom, you don't have to tell me who my dad is. Yeah. I know who he is. Awesome. And I walked out of the room yeah. and I was in tears yeah. and that got me through those first 24 hours because that's tough, you know? Yeah. Um, 
and um, only I can't him imagine. saying that, him saying that, and then he made this video uh, supporting me on. He did this video compilation and put it on, and I didn't see it for a couple of days. But people were saying, "Oh, what Sam did was so beautiful." And I went to the Wyatt's Garage, his charity website, and I saw this video, and that just like broke me i was amazing. like in in i was a mess sobbing mess yeah. goes to show you what's important yeah what's your biggest pet peeve um my biggest pet peeve uh probably uh when someone says i'll be honest or let me yes. be honest <laughs> Because I always yeah, think, not... what's the alternative? Are they gonna I want lie? you to lie to me. <laughs> <laughs> that's like, that's like, with all due respect. respect. <laughs> yeah. No disrespect, I mean, but you're an asshole. Without... <laughs> yeah. I might be a little out of line yeah. here. Yeah. This is going right. to come with complete disrespect. But... That was yeah. uh, Dom, oh, what was that comedian? Dom, Dom Imaginaire. Uh, the, the, yeah, that, Dom yeah, Herrera. That, yeah, Dom Herrera. Yeah, yeah, that whole bit. Yeah, yeah. No disrespect. What I'm going to do to you is... <laughs> Uh, uh, you're up on you're up on a karaoke stage. Yes, Peter. What are you singing? Born to Run. Oh, another Springsteen. Another song. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Bruce. 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 Yeah. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> okay, so American Girl. Tom Petty. <laughs> all, right. Okay, all right, all right, all right. All right. Okay. Oh, yeah. There's, I, but Bruce, Bruce is my guy. So uh, wow, I'm a wild, I'm a wild oh, with New Jersey guy. He's from Wildwood. <laughs> Save that for after the game. Uh, <laughs> all right. Um, if you could go back in time and give yourself a piece of advice, how old are you and what's that piece of advice? Uh, That's a great. Um, Those that's a great question. That's a that's a tough question. I would say that it was it would be the day I was driving backwards and and just don't be scared. And I would say to myself, don't be scared. You'll have a car that drives forward. <laughs> um, I think that's uh, this is not the that. end. <laughs> and the other one would probably be. Um, uh, I remember, um, you know, my. I remember when I was a kid and I was flunking French class and I was, my dad came from a parent teacher meeting and he stood in my doorway and he said, uh, it looks like they're going to hold you back because you're, you're not doing good in any of your classes and French you're flunking. And he said to me, uh, you gotta, you know, you gotta, you know, get your shit together. Basically. Um, I was so terrified that I wasn't going to, you know, amount to anything, I probably would say to myself, relax, mm. It'll, it's going to be fine. And yeah. um, because I, I was a mess after that, I thought I was going to be held back. And I, I didn't know what I was going to do. And I just started thinking about maybe leaving school, maybe getting a job. I didn't like I, I just, you know, I thought school was everything at the time. And um, mm -hmm. I probably would have said to myself, relax, take it easy. Uh, do the best you can. Um, you know, life's gonna, you know, gives you some ups and downs, but you'll get through it. Yeah, I try to tell my kids that now. I don't know if you guys do the same, but I'm like, it might seem like a big deal right now in high school, but it's really not. <laughs> yeah. I, you know, it is a big deal to you right now, but in the long run, it'll all work out. And Yeah. Yeah. yeah I try not to pressure my kids with grades. I, you know, they... If they work their ass off and if they, you know, get yeah, a beam up, see, they work their ass off. Yeah. Um, I just, you know, I didn't look at it that way. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. And I wish I had. Yeah. Karen, Pat, do you have a question? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> oh, boy. Uh, you have written one and produced another of uh, Pauly Shore's <laughs> films. Um, Son-in-law, P.S., I've watched it a thousand times. I was a, ch a tween in the early 90s, so uh, Son-in-law was, you know, it was just on HBO all the time, and I watched it all the time. Still love it. I still sing John Denver. You know, this scene when he's riding in the, in the, 
<laughs> he writes glass. crawl using the oh my god he writes crawl using the oh my god okay so crawl. amazing my question <laughs> for you is can you name two other Pauly Shore movies? Oh, God. Oh, yeah, In the Army Now and Biodome. Wow. Oh, man, he, oh. knows his, he knows his people. Are he you, knows his people. Well, Paul, you know, Paulie's Paul, a good friend, so still to this day. So I, uh, he would, you know, That's he great. would be very upset if I didn't know was, his... Was uh, he an right. Encino man? Yeah. Yes, Encino Of course man. he was. Encino uh, man, yeah. Geez, there's a class act. Uh, he was in class you know, act. Yeah, he was in class act. It's interesting. We made that movie. We made that movie. We were both about 25 years old and uh, we were kids and no, you know, he had just done Encino Man, but really had not really starred in a movie because uh, it hadn't come out yet. And uh, we were like two kids and somebody just gave us a pile of money to do something. We just had the great time. Dude, I was like between the ages of twelve and sixteen when all those movies came out. I saw every single one of them. I was like, <laughs> really? Yes. <laughs> Tell him I yeah, said hi. It's funny. It's funny. It came out the same year as Demolition Man, and uh, and they're so different. So different. Yeah. Pat, I don't have any questions. Good. You don't yeah, have anything. Good. No, I don't have you any. should ask one from my list. Uh, what's a terrible name for a child? Oh boy. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> you know you're gonna offend somebody. <laughs> Can we stop he's it right thinking. there? No, no. He's Can thinking. we stop it right there? <laughs> like your friend has a baby, and he goes, "Come over. You got to meet him." You go, "What's his name?" Texaco. Yeah. Texaco. <laughs> I have. A, I actually have a story that my friend. That, you can't told offend me. anybody. Texaco. Okay. Big oil. I. So my my we're playing golf, and my friend's having a baby, and he's like, "Yeah, well, I'm gonna name the kid Cash." Oh uh, yes. Cash so, money. Cash. Just cash. cash. I know. I know. Because he, he was. Know. He's always. We always called him Cash Coast. Cash Coast because of betting on the golf course. So he tells me a story. His father goes to him. How much cash do I have to give you not to name your kid Cash? <laughs> <laughs> Big shout That's out to funny. Chris Nichols. Um, happy birthday, Chris. <laughs> um. Peter. Terrific, man. That hot seat's not that hot. It I told dumb. you. It's fun. Yeah. It's fun. Um, but uh, thank you for coming uh, into Dom's yeah. Den and Learned a lot. Uh, yeah, sharing, thank you so much, sharing all these stories with us. Yeah. Yeah. Truly thank you, guys. That was thank awesome. Thank you so much. Terrific. Man. I miss you, pal. Miss you too, buddy. We look, forward to, we, we look forward to whatever's next, Peter. Yeah, whatever's down the thank pipe. You. Awesome. Thank you. Take right, care. Man.